I'm Carter McNamara with the Consultants Institute, and I'm here to present Current Trends in Organizations. In this video, we'll build on the foundational knowledge that you might have gleaned so far if you did the earlier CDI courses about consulting practices, people practices, and organizational practices. Now, we'll stand back a bit to look at current trends in organizations. We'll describe major driving forces that are dramatically changing how organizations are structured and how they operate today. We'll depict a new paradigm or worldview that is emerging about how we all see organizations, the activities within them, and our role in them as well. Then we'll look at a variety of different structures that organizations are using in part as strategies to survive and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Then we'll itemize trends in how organizations are led, managed, and governed. We'll end by summarizing the major trends that are occurring in the world of consulting and how you might benefit from them as well. When people read information about trends, they often react that the information seems too obvious, that everyone can already see that those trends are occurring. However, the value of the information in this course is not primarily to surprise you. Rather, it's to remind you to reflect on and act on the information. So when going through the course, be thinking about what consulting, people, and organizational skills that you might need to respond to the trends. For example, you might use the information to better align and market your services with the upcoming needs of your clients. Or you might use the information to help your clients make more informed choices about how to solve their problems. Business leaders might use the information to more effectively meet the needs of expanding markets locally and around the world. Nonprofit leaders might more readily discern what community needs to meet with new programs. But both types of leaders might operate their organizations to be more in alignment with the expanding and diverse needs of today's workers. The environments around today's organizations and the people working in them are changing dramatically. A variety of driving forces are provoking these changes. It's important for consultants and leaders to recognize those forces and their effects. For example, increasing technologies in computers and telecommunications have brought providers, markets, and communities much closer together. It's now much faster and cheaper for them to interact with each other. However, a downside of this is that there's a large demographic of poor people who do not even have access to the benefits of those technologies. Another driving force is the huge number of markets that technologies have opened up for businesses locally and around the world. The phrase, think globally, act locally, is now a mantra in sales and marketing. And that can mean more sales and profits for companies that can reach those markets. However, the mad rush to those new markets is taking a real toll on workers. Research indicates there's more burnout now than ever before. Another driving force is the broad diversity of consumers, stakeholders, and different generations that organizations must deal with now. Diversity brings different values, perspectives, and opinions which can cultivate strong creativity and innovation. However, Broad diversity also means that organizations have to work much harder at understanding and communicating with customers, clients, and employees. More markets mean stronger competition to reach those markets, and companies are using a variety of innovative strategies to compete, including decentralizing, outsourcing, remotely locating, and forming alliances around the world. However, that stronger competition is also leaving many smaller companies behind because the larger companies often have more resources to get to those new markets. Those driving forces cause strong social challenges that confront many governments and nonprofits around the world. For example, diverse workers have diverse needs that often cannot be met with long standing traditions and organizations. Constant and rapid change creates chaos and conflicts that cause stress and strains around the world. This does bring more attention to the plight of the poor, along with sometimes allocating more resources to nonprofit and government agencies. However, despite those governmental and philanthropic efforts, there continues to be a large growing gap between the rich and the poor in some countries. 
As organizations struggle to meet the needs of new markets, consumers, and employees, new ethical and legal issues arise. These issues have resulted not only in executives now serving long prison sentences, but in tremendous financial losses to people who otherwise could not afford them. And as a result, the public now demands that organizations operate in a much more ethical, transparent, and socially responsible manner. For example, there are now stronger laws and regulations about corporate auditing and disclosure. A disadvantage, though, is the tremendous overhead that it costs sometimes smaller organizations in conforming to those laws. For example, to the Sarbanes-Oxley regulations in the United States. Now is a good time to pause and reflect on what you've heard so far. And in your learning journal, answer the following questions. And if you don't have clients yet, then answer the questions with reference to the types of clients that you prefer to work with in the future. How might the effects of the driving forces affect the operations of, of your clients today? And how might your consulting services be most useful to them in that regard? Pause the video for now and give that some thought. Maybe discuss this even with some peers. And then write your answers down in your journal. As a result of these driving forces, organizations are required to adopt a, a new paradigm, and that is a new way of viewing and operating in the world. Marilyn Ferguson, in the book, The New Paradigm, Emerging Strategies for Leadership and Organizational Change, provides one of the most concise overviews of the differences between the old and those new paradigms. As we go through the following, be thinking about the effects of the driving forces on your clients and on your consulting. In the old paradigm, the top priority was consumption. Get as much as you want. In the new paradigm, it's to promote suitable consumption, to get what you really need. And in the old paradigm, people were supposed to fit into their jobs at whatever cost. But in the new, the jobs had better conform to the people within them. Otherwise, people are just as likely to leave those jobs. And in the old paradigm, decisions were mostly top down and bestowed upon the employees. But in the new, employees are much more involved in those decisions. In the old, work was often fragmented, almost like assembled parts in the manufacturing floor. In the new, activities are much more integrated and with more employee involvement. And in the old, people identified with their jobs. When they introduced themselves, they promptly told you what they did for a living. In the new, they'll first tell you about their lives and then about their jobs, but only if you ask. And in the old, the world was seen to operate like a clock with perfect parts that somehow fit perfectly together. In the new, we recognize that the world is much more chaotic and dynamic than that. In the old, the businesses believed that they had to beat the competition if they were to survive. But in the new, organizations see to cooperate if they're to thrive. Let's look at some more here. In the new paradigm, people would separate their work and their play. In the new, there's research books and suggestions all about how to have more joy at work. And in the old, nature was seen as a force to be dominated. In the new, we recognize that nature usually wins, but it can be a win-win situation when we cooperate with it. In the old, we struggled for stability and security, but in the new, we understand and even embrace the constantly changing world and our work within it. In the old, success was measured largely by quantity. In the new, success is measured as much by quality as quantity. It's measured by the experiences and impacts that organizations have on customers, clients, and employees around the world. And in the old, the organizations were driven primarily by economic motives, and that's by what makes for the best markets and sales. Now in the new, we're driven as much by the quality of the relationships in and around the organizations again. In the old, things were more polarized. It was us against them. But in the new, we realize that when others lose, we often lose. We're embracing now much more of an attitude of win-win. Of Let's look at just a few more real quickly here. In the old paradigm, the short-sighted view was dominant. For example, we used resources like they'd never run out. In the new paradigm, we know that 
That old assumption is just not true. Today, we're much more aware of the limitations of our precious resources and how we must continue to replenish them as well. And in the old, decisions were made primarily by rational data and analysis. However, in the new, decisions are made much more by our wisdom and our intuition as well. And then in the old organizations that were centralized and their operations were more under the control of some top-down leadership for more control and influence. Now in the new, operations are much more decentralized to be more in touch with consumers, clients, and employees, and to be more responsive to them as well. In the old, we used new technologies wherever they could bring greater efficiencies. We automated because we could. And in the new, we realize that technology is merely a tool to get something done. And we recognize that its disadvantages sometimes outweigh its advantages. And last, in the old paradigm, we reacted to problems far too often simply by treating their symptoms. However, in this new paradigm, we can see within the recurring dynamics of systems and find causes of those symptoms as well. We're better at solving problems than at even presenting preventing them from happening in the first place. To be more responsive and adaptable in dealing with today's driving forces, organizations are finding new ways to structure and organize themselves. So let's look briefly at some of the more novel structures here. Many organizations are evolving from a highly centralized to a decentralized, that is a flatter set of operations. And this allows employees to be much closer to recognizing the needs of their customers and to be more responsive to meeting those needs as well. A decentralized structure also empowers employees to have more autonomy and influence in their organizations. The networked organization is a linking of separate organizations that have one overall goal in common. For example, they're a strategic alliance formed to build a complex product or a certain uh, system for a certain customer, the networked organization might not even be its own distinct legal entity. Instead, it might operate according to an operating agreement among different organizations. Although this structure can include more resources and capabilities than any of its member organizations, it can be a significant challenge to effectively coordinate the different organizations that are linked together. In the virtual organization, Members interact with customers and each other almost completely or completely by means of telecommunications. And that can significantly reduce capital costs since there is little need for the typically very expensive buildings and facilities in which to locate employees. Also, that gives employees the opportunities to telecommute, that is to work from wherever is most convenient for them. Self-managed teams are useful where the activities to achieve the team's goal are highly innovative and complex. In these teams, members need the freedom to develop their own processes for working with each other, including to determine their leadership roles and their ways of making decisions and solving problems. Self-managed teams pose a unique challenge for the traditional manager because it can be extremely difficult to let go of the traditional control that managers are so used to. In contrast to self-managed teams, members of self-organizing teams take the initiative to first organize themselves. They might have identified the overall goal for the team to achieve along with the process to achieve that goal. They might modify their process based on the feedback they get from their management and from those they aim to serve. The manager of members in this structure places far more value on getting high quality results and learning than on controlling the members of the team. Many people would assert that a learning organization is not really a new structure. Rather, it's a movement to increase the performance of the organization. In a learning organization, managers don't direct their employees as much as they facilitate them to generate and apply new learning from their own experiences. Managers in a learning organization might ensure that all employees exchange ongoing feedback and, and reflections on that feedback in order to learn. And trends are affecting nonprofit organizations as well. Nonprofits and for profits even seem to be learning more from each other lately, for example, in how they build their boards, measure results, and even in how they generate profits. Many people believe that nonprofits are very different from for profits because the nature of their missions is very different. One seeks to maximize profit, 
while the other seeks to serve their communities. And other people believe that differences in the nature of a mission do not mean dramatic differences in how they operate. These people might assert that differences between any organizations have more to do with their cultures and their current stage in their life cycle. They might add that a small nonprofit is much more like a small for-profit than a large nonprofit. Like their for-profit counterparts, nonprofits are rapidly using more technologies ranging from automation of the office activities to the delivery and measurement of program services. They use the internet and web for reaching out to serve remotely located or low-income clients. They use these technologies for helping others to improve the quality of their lives. And like for-profits, nonprofits are also feeling increasing pressure to be more accountable. One of the most notable indicators of this trend is the nonprofit Form 990 used in the United States now. Like the laws and regulations facing for-profit boards, that form aims to accomplish more transparency and accountability in operations. Another indication of increased accountabilities is the use of program outcome evaluations, and that's to measure the actual benefits to clients from having participated in the nonprofit's programs. Nonprofits are giving much more attention to succession planning because recent research suggests that their CEOs are experiencing significant disappointment and burnout. And this is due mostly to the typically low salaries and sometimes the frustrations of continuous fundraising. Like small nonprofits and for-profits, they, they can struggle to remain sustainable. Uh, where for-profits strive to maintain sufficient revenue through more sales, Nonprofits often strive to accomplish sustainability through more diverse revenue streams. For example, by soliciting funds from a diverse set of sources, such as individuals, foundations, corporations, and government. Nonprofits are also turning to strategies to generate profit to work towards their mission. And these nonprofits are often referred to as social enterprises. Many funders prefer that nonprofits use social enterprise to become more self-sustainable. Now, we'll look at trends in leadership. Like the literature about organizational change, there's been an explosion in the literature about leadership and management. The information on this slide is about prominent trends in leadership and management, particularly trends that are affected by the other trends that we've discussed so far. More than ever, it's important now that leaders and managers develop just basic skills in them leading themselves, leading others, groups, and organizations. There are numerous sources of assistance for this professional development, including low-cost government programs and also free online programs. The best forms of learning, though, tend to be on-the-job activities, coupled with coaching and training programs. The most useful skill in dealing with the rapid change that we've talked about is the skill of continuous learning. That does not mean continuously taking classes. Rather, it means continuously learning from the past and current experiences by continuously reflecting on them. We talked a lot about reflection in the previous course about coaching conversations. And today's leaders and managers also must develop skills in managing polarities. The distinguishing feature of, a feature of a polarity is that there seems to be two sides to the situation, and each side is heavily dependent on the other. Strong skills and polarity management can consistently bring out the best of both sides of a situation. Here are several polarities that will soon exist even more in organizations. Today's leaders and managers must think globally, but at the same time, they must act locally. Another polarity is to manage, is to centralize versus to decentralize. And yet another is to compete, yet to collaborate. Good managers and leaders can deal with these polarities where both sides win. A recent movement in leadership development is to focus on leading in conditions of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. There's even an acronym, VUCA, that is used to reference the leadership skills needed for these conditions. Innovation is a top priority for any organization that's striving to do more with less. Innovation is the process of creatively producing a process more effectively and efficiently to conduct operations in the workplace. We'll look now at trends in governance or, or boards of directors. 
because very prominent ethical and legal issues have resulted in much more public scrutiny of how corporations are being governed. And that in turn has resulted in new rules and regulations, especially in the United States. And these have combined to produce several important trends in the operations of boards. Boards in all types of corporations are now expected to ensure much more transparency and accountability in their operations and in the operations of their companies. An example is the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation that affects publicly listed corporations in the United States. It imposes requirements about how board members are selected and trained, how they coordinate audits, and how they oversee financial management and reporting to stakeholders. There's also more focus on overseeing stronger organizational performance management. The performance management process is ideal for board members to ensure high quality performance of their corporations. We talked about performance management in an earlier course. Another trend is much more attention to risk management. And risk encompasses far more than managing finances. It encompasses risks in loss of key personnel, risks in public relations problems, or risks if a product inadvertently harms someone. And succession planning. It's become a top priority for boards in all types of organizations. The tenure of a CEO has been dramatically decreasing. And all aspects of an organization can be deeply affected when a CEO leaves the organization. Recent legislation has given shareholders more influence in getting the information they need to protect their investments. They're also given more influence in how boards operate to protect those investments. And as a result, corporations that sell stock are facing increasing pressure to cultivate stronger relations with their shareholders. And as a result of these trends, there's an increasing number of training programs to teach board members how to accomplish stronger governance. As a result, they have stronger skills in strategizing, supervising the CEO, making group decisions, and overseeing executions of plans. Now we'll look at trends in consulting, because this virtual CDI series is carefully designed to convey the foundational knowledge needed by professional consultants today. And you'll notice that the topics on this slide about trends in consulting are very similar to those included in the various CDI courses in the series. Similar to the skills needed in continuous learning by leaders and managers as a, a consultant, you also need to have those skills. And they come particularly from reflecting on your past and current experiences to identify your new knowledge, skills, and abilities. All types of consultants should understand the systems in which they work, including how they work and how to change them. Consultants who focus only on people skills or only on business skills can have substantial impact on organizations However, for successful, long-lasting change, it's often best if consultants can work with all aspects of the overall system and the subsystems within them. Consultants also should have strong skills in conducting coaching conversations and in facilitating groups. Advice can be very timely and useful, but it rarely is sufficient alone for guiding and supporting long-lasting change. Consultants can use those two methods along with advice and materials to guide and support clients to make better decisions and to more effectively solve problems. But consultants should also have experience in using some of today's powerful tools for decision making and problem solving, many of them are on computers. One of the most important skills for consultants today, and especially for tomorrow, is the skill in embracing diversity. And skills in diversity are skills in appreciating not only people in different races and ethnicity and gender, but people with different values, perspectives, and opinions. This critically important skill gets the buy-in needed for successful change, and it cultivates the innovation that's needed to compete in today's competitive marketplaces. The last trend we'll mention here is the importance for consultants to comprehend the other trends in organizations, leadership, and management, including those described in this course. Knowledge of those trends helps consultants to be more effective in serving their clients and in marketing themselves as professional consultants. And now is a good time again to reflect on what you've heard so far. So in your learning journal, answer the following questions. What are the implications of the trends in consulting on your own consulting or on plans for your consulting? And what changes might you make to your plans for your consulting as well? So you can pause the video and give this some thought. Perhaps discuss these questions with peers and then write your answers 
in your journal. If you ever have any questions or want to share feedback during the series, simply send an email to info at consultantsdevelopmentinstitute.org. Again, thank you for your time during this video.